Several months ago now, we had Gary Chartier on the show to talk about the corporation problem in libertarian thought. As an actual historical phenomenon, the modern corporation was a direct outgrowth of medieval kingship. Over the early modern centuries, monarchs broke up their bodies of special powers and privileges to distribute them for a price to their most favored toadies. After the revolution, Congress and state legislatures usurped the monarch's role. By democratizing the corporation, our early libertarian loco focos began a long process by which we came to positively identify ourselves as part of the modern capitalist class. Capitalism seems to include space for you and me, just as much as Bill Gates or Warren Buffett. But maybe we need to go back to that actual historical phenomenon before we go around making it part of our identity or endorsing the modern economy. To do this and more, I've invited Kevin Carson to join us, a self-described anarchist without adjectives. Welcome to Liberty Chronicles, a project of libertarianism.org. I'm Anthony Comegna. So my first question to you was going to be to give us a, a definition for capitalism, um, and especially because I know that, that you're concerned with rooting our definitions of capitalism in the actual historical development of capitalism. So could you go ahead and start us off there? When I refer to capitalism, I'm referring to the actual historical system that succeeded uh, feudalism uh, five or six hundred years ago um, and not to any kind of idealized or normative free market system. And I see the defining features of capitalism as including uh, very high degree of uh, state involvement on behalf of the property classes with the state acting in many cases as an agent of the property classes. Uh, capitalism was founded on large scale robbery, uh, enclosure and expropriation of land, imperial conquest of foreign resources, enslavement, uh, state repression of the laboring classes and uh, legal prohibitions against freedom of association and movement by them. Yeah, that's basically it. I mean, in some sense, that makes capitalism sound like everything that's wrong with modernity. Um, what What is the like essential feature of capitalism that makes it different from those earlier uh, pre-modern economic systems? Well, the uh, dominance of the cash nexus is probably the main thing that distinguishes it from feudalism and uh, the disposition of uh, laboring classes from actual occupancy of the means of production. I think Marx put it uh, uh, as uh, the freedom of uh, the working classes, both from obligation to their employer and from the from ownership of the means of production, turning them into propertyless uh, market agents who were forced to sell their labor on the boss's terms in order to survive. So would you really mark uh, enclosure in a place like uh, early modern England as the origins of capitalism? Uh, that and uh, the predominance of the cash nexus in place of direct production for use. So if – now what – we recently talked to Nima Sanandaji um, who is an Iranian Kurd – historian and he he treats capitalism or entrepreneurship um, free markets in a very broad sense as something that's a fundamental component of civilization uh, throughout world history but then there are of course these uh, historians who treat it as a s sort of singularly modern phenomenon with a definite origin point um, and I think in part at least that's because 
You know, that's that's how Marx wanted to talk about it when he really invented the term. Could could you take us back to just the the history of the use of the the word capitalism to describe the the culture of exploitation or expropriation that Marx was trying to describe? Well, I, I'm uh, not really a, a scholar of, of the history of the term, but uh, from what I've been able to gather, it was the term capitalism was first coined by anti-capitalist radicals in the uh, early to mid 19th century in reference to the actually existing system they lived under. And uh, by the late 19th century, it was being used in some cases as synonymous with Marx's, uh, with Marx, I'm sorry, with markets. Uh, there were some individualist radicals uh, in the Boston anarchist uh, group in the United States who seemed to oscillate quite a bit between Consider the, considering themselves socialists or anti-capitalists and referring to their position as uh, capitalist anarchism, uh, just de- depending on the context or uh, who they were, they were debating with. Uh, I think Voltaire de Clare wrote a piece uh, on a debate between a capitalist anarchist and a communist anarchist where she was using capitalist anarchist in in reference to the same Tuckerite position that Benjamin Tucker himself had considered socialistic. Uh, and then by the earliest early uh, 20th century uh, when von Mises was writing, um, he used capitalism unambiguously as the idealized system he was uh, advocating, I think, uh, is a sort of in-your-face attempt at recuperating the term from its enemies, and Ayn Rand followed suit. Now this this does get me to uh, my next point, which is that I I find it very interesting um, that my favorite documents or some of my favorite historical documents from the 19th century are from both the most libertarian people you could ever encounter from the time period, and they are visceral anti-capitalists, and they are condemning the exact kinds of historical phenomenon that you've that you've been talking about and the conflation of concepts that you've been pointing out here. Um, and it, it, it makes me, uh, it prompts me to ask, ask you the question, um, can you describe your, your concept or term vulgar libertarianism for us? Um, it's a lot like uh, what Marx referred to as ver- vulgar political economy when the... Um, Industrial capitalists uh, supplanted the Whig landed oligarchy as the primary political power in in Great Britain. Uh, political economy, which had been a fairly radical and anti-establishment doctrine uh, when Smith and Ricardo were writing, uh, was critical of the landed interests and mercantilism and so forth shifted gears into a defensive or apologetic mode on behalf of industrial capital, uh, acting, you know, as Marx said, as hired prize fighters on behalf of the ruling class. And that's what I see vulgar liber- libertarianism as today. Uh, there were major currents of classical liberalism in the 19th century that were radical or anti- anti-capitalist, you know, including Thomas uh, Hodgkin in Great Britain, uh, the individual anarchists in the United States, Henry George, and so forth. Uh, 
but by the late 19th century, the bulk of the movement or the mainstream of the movement had shifted into uh, defending the interests of industrial capital. And today, mainstream libertarianism uses the uh, rhetoric of the free market in order to defend big business against criticism. We see articles written in defense of sweatshop labor saying that uh, sweatshops are good because they're the best available option for the people who work there and they completely ignore the fact that the options are deliberately restricted by the state acting in collusion with employers. So they're, they're defending actually existing capitalism as if it were a free market. It strikes me that um, all sorts of people are vulgar versions of whatever their ideological group is, um, at least to the extent that people have membership in some ideological group. Um, and I think that has something to do with what purposes history serves for us. Uh, for, for most people, it seems to be the, the purpose of history, of learning it and studying it, caring about it, is to confirm your biases, whatever they might be. Even libertarians do that all the time. You, you end up defending what you like about the status quo, the world that you inherited, however it is. Um, and rather than you know, embracing a sort of totally hands-off libertarian futurism where you just say, I, I'm not going to try to shape and control the future. People get wound up in protecting what they feel like they already have. Um, I mean, I, I wonder if you could comment on what you think our, our study or understanding of history uh, has contributed to vulgar libertarianism. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, to be honest, it's something I've not uh, thought of a lot, although uh, I remember... Uh, reading a passage in Human Action where Mises admitted that the enclosures were bad things and that they were unjust but framed the capitalists as um, the good guys by offering employment to all of these dispossessed peasants and saving them from starvation. And he argued that the uh, capitalist employers were just uh, basically master tradesmen who had been unusually frugal and productive and saved up their income to invest in industry and expand it. Uh, so there's some, uh, I guess you'd say, unrealistic or falsified uh, view of history in that case uh, because you know that was that was obviously not that was obviously not factually correct uh, but as as uh, far as the question goes of, of you know whether there's any consistent or, or comprehensive vulgar libertarian view of history uh, it's not something I really thought of a lot. I think uh, most of the people I've encountered just uh, ignore the question of history altogether. They treat uh, capitalism as a system that's axiomatic or self-evident or a universal set of rules of, of human behavior rather than a system with a historical beginning and end or uh, the ongoing laws of motion. Now, you know, that that's that brings up another interesting thought to me. Um, it strikes me that one of the, the biggest drawbacks of thinking in this vulgar libertarian fashion is that you forget that there were ever alternatives available to people, that this the way that we live now or the way that we're used to living is the only way that that was ever, you know, reasonable or good or just or whatever, and that 
Um, there probably weren't any better alternatives available to people. Otherwise, they would have taken them. But of course, that's not true. And to me, a great example of this is uh, pirate ships in the golden age of Atlantic piracy, where people ship by ship were literally revolutionizing society on the ship and creating their new you know, micro societies and micro civilizations um, that floated around the world. And the great empires of the day had to all get together and prosecute an international war against pirates to clear them out because they were such a threat to international trade under you know, corporations and insurance companies were being hit and the navies were having to pay a lot to, to um, defend from pirates and they were a serious threat to the, the global status quo of massive empires. And, you know, if, if, <laughs> if we see ourselves identifying more with the merchant uh, and the imperialist side of that divide, uh, that spells big problems because, you know, we'll, we forget that um, there are all sorts of ways for people to live more freely. I wonder if you could if you could give us some examples of maybe alternative social structures out there that really are available as historical examples, but we just don't give enough time to them. Well, I think they've they've only existed, you know, for the most part since the rise of the most uh, of the first states and the most uh, marginal areas outside of state control and. The dominant trend in history has been for those kinds of alternatives to be deliberately suppressed uh, in order to prevent any kind of comp uh, competition from existing that would uh, weaken the ability of ruling classes to exploit. Uh, and, to the, and to the extent that these systems have existed, uh, you know, again, they're, they've mostly been uh, marginal and uh, ephemeral, but they generally fit the pattern uh, that David Graeber, or not David Graeber, uh, James C. Scott referred to as uh, Zomian, um, non-state spaces in areas that are not amenable to control, uh, marshlands, uh, mountainous areas, and so forth. Uh, you know, the classic example would be Israel under the judges, which I think uh, was originally a Zomian type population of runaway peasants and debtors and slaves from the Canaanite lowlands who who settled in the central highlands of Palestine and, and formed a tribal confederation with laws de deliberately designed to keep a landed or moneyed ruling class from ever arising again. And other examples uh, are the kinds of things you described, the various uh, pirate utopias, uh, Zomian societies on the edge of American society, uh, like uh, amalgamations of Native American tribes and runaway slaves and runaway white debtors and indentured servants forming communities in the backwaters of the, the American Southeast or the uh, Cossacks on the frontiers of Imperial Russia, so forth, the traveling people like the tra uh, British travelers, the Romani, and so forth. A lot of these sorts of examples that libertarians might point to or that they really like pointing to strike back to the pre-modern world. And I mean, on the one hand, that tells us, well, you know, the, one of the key features of modernity is the rise of the modern state, this massive, totally new sort of institution that's able to control more about people's lives than you know uh, pharaohs of old were ever able to, right? Uh, the, its ability to intrude on the average person's life is so much greater than before. 
So then why are we so antagonistic sometimes to other ideas that stretch back to the same sort of time period? And now I, <laughs> I have what might be a controversial, controversial question for you, which is if you could address the labor theory of value and your sort of economic philosophy of mutualism, um, and where do you think that fits into the broader libertarian tradition? Um, okay. Um, before I do that, could I go back to the previous question? Because I think I, I neglected a whole f important facet of that. Uh, things that are going on in the present day within the interstices of of capitalism, like uh, the new municipalist movements in uh, in uh, Spanish cities created by post M15 activists in Barcelona and Madrid and so forth and other European cities as well. Uh, and uh, Jackson, Mississippi in the United States, uh, the Cleveland Evergreen Initiatives uh, and all these different uh, interstitial attempts at building counter institutions are things I think that are coalescing together and forming the kernel of a post-capitalist system uh, as the existing system decays. There are also contemporary systems on the, on the Zomian pattern like uh, the Kurdish Rojava experiment. But anyway, uh, to answer your your last question, uh, to be honest, I, I don't really consider myself a mutualist, or at least I don't identify uh, primarily as a mutualist or market anarchist these days. Uh, I usually call myself an anarchist without adjectives, but I can say that uh, Mutualism as a philosophy, it's uh, the name itself is is identified with Proudhon with his uh, emphasis on mutuality or reciprocity, his basic organizing principles of society. But uh, when I called myself a mutualist, when I wrote the book on mutualist political economy, the primary concrete economics I had in mind were those of uh, radical or socialistic classical liberals like Thomas Hodgkin, uh, the American individualists and Franz uh, Oppenheimer. And the uniting idea was that the defining feature of modern capitalism is state intervention to enforce artificial scarcities and artificial property rights of various sorts that enable monopoly rent returns on the ownership of land, capital, and so on, as well as uh, more recent forms of state intervention to socialize the operating costs of big business to suppress comp competition and so forth, and that if you abolished all of these state enforced monopolies and all of these artificial scarcities, market competition would destroy rent and profit and interest for the most part and result in, in labor receiving the full value of its product as a wage. Now, do you see, uh, moving to the subject of a post-capitalism that we might be opening on. Do you see that happening right now? I do. I think, uh, you know, as I said before, capitalism is a historic system with a beginning uh, and an end. And uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of crisis tendencies going on right now that indicate the system has reached its limits and it's in the process of decay. And I mean, it seems to me that especially with some of the radical new production technologies where you can produce things in your home in ways that you could not before, and especially with uh, 
you know, 10, 20 years of more research and development, who knows what sort of a, a world we'll be living in. Um, but it seems like there will be a much smaller role for concentrated capital if people can create so many things cheaply on their own or share things cheaply on their own. Yeah, a big influence on me has been the, uh, in the last few years, has been the autonomous uh, Marxist, especially the most recent writers like uh, Nick Dyer Witherford and uh, Negri and Hart. Um, and their idea is that the production process is becoming less something where the means of production are owned by capitalists and more the sort of thing where the production process is becoming coextensive with society as a whole with the social factory and and the main source of productivity is human relationships and social capital and the model they promote is exodus where workers basically pick up their social capital and vote with their feet and cut the capitalists out as superfluous parasites from uh, a social economy that's already uh, in process of, of formation. Uh, they don't really, these writers don't really uh, address very much from what I've seen um, the cheapening or ephemeralization of physical production technology or the ability to produce directly for use within the social economy or within the commons, uh, though that is something uh, Massimo De Angelis, <clears throat> excuse me, has written about in his work on the commons. Um, also, I think uh, another thing that's really influenced me a lot uh, is the framework of uh, Michelle Bowens at the Foundation for Peer-to-Peer -Peer Alternatives. He argues that there are two major crisis tendencies in late capitalism. Until, until the present, uh, capitalist uh, business models and rent extraction have depended on the artificial abundance of material resources that have been looted and enclosed with the help of the state so that they're able to pursue a growth model based on extensive addition of material inputs rather than more intensively or efficiently using existing inputs. And that that depends on free access to these looted resources. And the other, other thing capitalism is dependent on is the artificial scarcity of information through intellectual property laws and, and so forth. Uh, and it's become even more dependent on these things in recent years as the means of production become cheaper and smaller in scale because... Um, the means of production themselves are becoming more amenable to small scale ownership by individuals or small groups and so forth. I think uh, a, a garage shop using uh, tabletop CNC machine tools could probably you know, open source tools uh, could probably produce uh, a lot of the goods uh, that previously required a million dollar factory with uh, a set of machinery equivalent to uh, skilled blue collar workers uh, wages for six months. So capitalism depends increasingly on uh, not capitalist ownership of the means of production, but in uh, 
legal monopolies over the right to produce, uh, like, uh, like patents. And Bowens argued that both of these uh, pillars of, of capitalism are becoming eroded. Uh, in the case of artificial abundance of material resources, it's through peak resource uh, crises of various sorts, like uh, peak oil, the fiscal crisis of the state, and its inability to continue providing subsidies on the scale that are, that are required and so on. And in the case of information, the growing unenforceable unenforceability of intellectual property law so that uh, the state is no longer able to prevent people from producing directly for themselves in the common, just going to an industrial equivalent of of uh, the Pirate Bay and downloading CAD files to produce stuff in the garage factories. You know, that uh, the capitalism has reached the limits of its ability to grow and is in process of decay. And again, as it's decaying, we've got all these things growing up in the interstices to handle the pressures that are put on people by precarity and the collapse of the welfare state and so forth, like we see with the commons-based municipal movements in Barcelona and Madrid. And they're they're the seeds of a post-capitalist system that are coalescing together. Kevin Carson holds the Carl Hess Chair in Social Theory at the Center for a Stateless Society, where he's also a senior fellow. Some of his latest books include The Homebrew Industrial Revolution, Organization Theory, and The Desktop Regulatory State. His current project is Exodus, General Idea of the Revolution in the 21st Century. Liberty Chronicles is a project of libertarianism.org. It is produced by Tess Terrible. If you've enjoyed this episode of Liberty Chronicles, please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes. For more information on Liberty Chronicles, visit libertarianism.org.